Welcome to episode two of the Left Shoe Politics podcast. I'm your host, Rick Shoe. With me today are my co-hosts, Michael Malloy and Jeremy Grokley. Gentlemen, how goes it? Good. Good to be here again. All right, Rick. Glad to be back. Awesome. Glad to have you guys back. And then we want to welcome a returning guest. Um, he's back for the second time on our second show, so this is very cool. Huff Post film critic and professor of media studies and communication, Zaki Hassan. Good morning, sir. I want to kind of give you the floor here real fast. Pl- plug something for us. What's what's going on with you most recently? Because you've got a lot of cool stuff on up online, man. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks so much. The uh, la- latest thing I wanted to put the word out about is the new episode of the Nostalgia Theater podcast, where I'm joined by Star Trek comic book writer and novelist Glenn Greenberg, and we watch the second pilot episode of the original Star Trek series and do a commentary track where we drop some nerdy Trek uh, uh, tidbits and also talk about the history of the franchise and our history of the franchise. And we're celebrating 50 years of Star Trek, so we're having some fun. It's awesome. I listened to it yesterday. I really loved it. In fact, kind of doing this thing on Facebook, where we're going to do kind of a guest profile. And so I put uh, I put that up yesterday. So if everybody... Can't, if you can't find it anywhere else, you have no excuses because you can even find it on Left Shoe. Well, and I appreciate you putting the word out. Thank you. Absolutely. And then we want to welcome to the panel for the first time Anna Rim. She is a defense attorney in L.A., and she worked for the Obama campaign in 2008. Anna, how are you? Hi, I'm good, Rick. Happy to be here. I'm so glad to have you. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, guys, so before we dive into our topics, I wanted to bring up something that uh, <laughs> just in the last 12 hours, Trump has already made headlines with his – oh, and this is his metamorphosis, right? This is where he has changed, and he's a new man and has his new, his new, his new tactic in terms of his, uh, his campaign. But let's, let's just talk briefly about a comment he made yesterday evening. Now, I don't want to – I hesitate to bring this up in the sense that I don't want to turn this into a debate about gun control or anything like that. I just wanted to get everybody's sort of gut reaction about he is now using this line of attack saying that Hillary Clinton is so against the Second Amendment. She's going to take all your guns away if she's elected president. And then he said yesterday, let's take all the guns away from her security guards and Secret Service and let's see what happens to her. Anybody want to just want a comment on that? I just wanted to throw that out there. Is this is this a man fit to be president? Well, it's obviously not a man fit to be president. Um, I think that this single comment highlights that in just so many different ways, not only with its lack of tact, but uh, it's factually inaccurate, it's hyperbolic, it's inflammatory, and then just semantically the way he chooses to tack on at the end the whole let's see what happens to her just sort of reinforces the impression of him that he's you know willing to incite violence or suggest that bad things should happen to people who don't agree with him or people like him. And it's just, it, it, like you said, it, it reinforces the idea that it's just not a person that we should be electing to represent us to the rest of the world. No, and it's just dangerous, right? What he's saying, and I can just almost hear the, the deplorables, if you will, screaming, yeah, shooter, killer, and a faction of his fans, his followers, whatever you want to call them, they say that. All right, we'll move on. I just that just it made me sick. I woke up this morning to that news, and I just wanted to vent about it. Some more Trump news. So after four, no, 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 no. After what seven and a half, eight years now of, of pounding the birtherism drum, being the original birther, if you will, the birther in chief, uh, Donald Trump came out yesterday, guys, and you know what? Lo and behold, finally had had the what's the word decency. To say that Obama was, in fact, born in the United States. I feel like that's the wrong word. I would say decency, really. Isn't he just a swell guy, right? (laughs) He really came around there. Yeah, so he he came around. He finally saw the, you know... The the air of his ways. Yeah, the air of his ways. I'm not sure that he did. I mean, I think that when I... I used to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was just being disingenuous and sort of being a carnival barker playing to the crowd and playing up this idea that he knew there were people out here who believed that Obama was sort of an interlooper and a, you know, Kenyan Muslim. And he was just, he was playing an act and he was playing to these people. But when I watched him make that statement yesterday, if you can call it a statement. I mean, it was like, it was almost like pulling teeth. He did not, those words did not want to come out of his mouth. And I don't think it was just because he didn't want to admit that he'd been wrong. I think he really genuinely believes the things that he was saying. And he was having a hard time suggesting that he didn't. Zachy, why did he do it? Well, I think what happened is that Kellyanne Conway took him into a back room and smacked him around a little bit and said, you need to put this behind you because otherwise you're going to be answering questions about it from now until, you know, election day. 
And um, that's the gritted teeth reason. I mean, for whatever reason, she's able to she's been able to get him to, quote unquote, moderate to the degree that he has. She should have given him a better script then if that's what happened, because if that's what she thought was going to put it to rest, then she's wrong. You don't think that she probably did give him a script and he just ignored her? Ooh, and I think that you're on to something there. I think I think what he did is she gave him a script and he's like, all right. I'm gonna say it, but that's it. And I'm gonna drop. I'm gonna drop the mic and leave. And I, and I'm telling you, that's that that doesn't fly with me. And yeah, I I can't stand him. Okay, so I get it. But but the whole thing even was for, a big bait and switch, though, right? It I was. Mean, yeah. He just added it in there, and then he tried to have a press conference, and so he could have a big long infomercial. I mean, the, even just the right. idea is to continue to try to, you know, irritate the press. I mean, they want the story, but well, I was hearing reports of them. Uh, deleting the footage off of off of news sites, they were so mad that he he agreed to take questions at the end of it. That's why they ran with it, and now he just completely abandoned that plan altogether. It's it. I mean, it. He made it worse, and once again, I think just because he cannot control himself. Right. Yeah. Well, Chris well, uh, Chris Deliza for the Washington Post wrote an article last night titled "Donald Trick's Birther Event Is the Greatest Trick He's Ever Pulled," and it was about the way Donald Trump sort of plays the media and gets free media time and how he built this thing up is, you know, I'm going to make a major statement and leaked that it was going to be about birtherism and retracting his statement and all of that. And then it turned out to be, he just got 90 minutes of free coverage of veteran after veteran coming up to the stage and endorsing him and saying how great he was and then got to give a tour of his hotel and spent, you know, 34 seconds semi retracting uh, the birther stuff and also blaming it on Hillary. And it was really, it was, what was funny was it was really, a negative comment on Donald Trump and Donald Trump retweeted the, right. uh, the article. And I was like, you realize this isn't a compliment, right? I mean, what are you trying to say that? Yes, you control the media. Or are you trying to say, or are you just proving that you don't understand uh, when you're being mocked? But I think that Siliza was right. He really is. He's, he's totally figured out how to play the media. When, when was the last time you had a Hillary event with all of the surrogates coming up onto the stage that was covered beginning to end? You don't get that, but Donald Trump gets it. Yeah, but I, it, that has to be that, you know, what's the statistic where they say the amount of people that end up liking something on social media, they'll see an article that they think like agrees with them, and then they'll like it, and then they'll never actually end up reading it. And that had to be like what he's doing, right? He's just like a teenager on social media. Ooh, they're talking about me. Let's share it, right? right. It's just one more way that he's ridiculous. But he also <laughs> knows his audience won't even read the article, so they'll probably even they're gonna do the like it, thing. and they'll be able to have a source to rely on to say, well, this this source also said he was great because they never read it, but it doesn't matter because by the time they tell 100,000 people that this was awesome, everyone's yeah, going to believe that too. Yeah, I think that's a great too. point. You're right because he didn't read it and neither is his audience because they're not reading anything on facts. I, I don't know if they're reading at all, but let's move on from that. I, I want to say this real fast too. This is not just about birtherism, okay? There, there is this ongoing narrative that he has led the charge on that Obama is a, a secret Muslim, which again, when did that become a bad thing that someone's a Muslim? In my life, I guess, I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly when that happened, but well, secret apparently, Muslim, that's, though. Secret. apparently that's a bad thing. I guess the implication is that he's a terrorist. He's a okay. Kenyan Muslim spy baby. <laughs> Kenyan, Kenyan Muslim spy baby. Okay. All right. That he's anti-American. Okay. He's other. That he's other he, than. He hates this country, that we want to emphasize his middle name, Hussein. Because it's a Muslim name. This will make sure everybody knows that he's Barack Hussein Obama. Yeah, his middle name is Hussein, but no one no one says someone's middle name like that. Thankfully, they don't mind because it's a long redneck name. And then um, in addition to that, his college records. We, they, we want to see his, his collegiate records because you know what? We just don't believe that a black guy is really all that smart. Hey, and nobody saw him at Harvard. Why does nobody remember him when they were growing up? I mean, these are literally the things that are in the psyche of the modern day alt right or like modern day right party. Yeah, things. And Donald believe. Trump and Donald Trump is the cheerleader for all these topics. Now, Zachy, I'm gonna throw this question at you really quickly. So right now they're trying to blame this on the Hillary Clinton campaign that they started it. Now, as I understand it, and you, please elaborate on this as well. There was a rogue consultant, or I don't even know what the hell you would refer to the person as, but somebody in 2008 said something to somebody in a memo that maybe we should question his birthplace. And that is their reasoning to somehow justify that, A, this was a legitimate thing from the Clinton campaign, 
and that it was something that was truly a narrative that she herself was trying to get out to the masses. And that is somehow on the, is, is an equivalency, is on the same playing field as seven and a half years of lies and hate speech. And also I want to remind everybody that in 2011, he was on with, I believe, Katie Couric. And forgive me if I have the journalist incorrectly here, but I think that's who he was talking to. And he was telling her that he has all these um, – these investigators in Hawaii, and guess what? You're not going to believe what they're finding. I'm telling you, it's I'm telling very you, very interesting tough. what they're finding. It's very, very <laughs> interesting, and I'll never forget John Stewart's historic smackdown of that whole thing. But uh, that's a side note. So, Zachy, so what, what are your thoughts? Just a specific question in terms of them trying to blame it on the Hillary Clinton campaign. Does that have any legs at all? Well, I think it has legs among you know the the people that he's appealing to. I mean, I, I don't doubt for a second that, you know, from what I've read, the, uh, Sidney Blumenthal, who was, you know, associated with the Clinton camp, uh, was one of the people who was kind of supposedly reaching out to the media about this story back in 08. I mean, I, you know, that sounds like it could very well be true. Does that mean it came from the candidate herself? I don't think so. I doubt it, but you never know. What I will say definitively is that it didn't originate with the Clinton campaign and it didn't end with the Trump campaign. So he dropped two whoppers in the middle of his admitting that President right. Obama is an American citizen. Yeah. And, um, and it's almost like, it's like trying to plug holes in a dam, right? How many lies can you try to swat down? I think that's, it's just through sheer volume. That's how much of his crap gets through. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, by sheer volume. You're, um, go, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. I think that, you know, Zaki's right with the, what he, with the, where he started was it, it's really going to only have legs within the people who already believe that sort of thing. I did a fair amount of research on this yesterday myself because I was, you know, arguing with people on Twitter. So I went and read all the articles and I uh, read all of the fact checks and things like that. And, uh, you know, what you and Zaki are both referring to with the strategist was somebody who within the Clinton campaign uh, wrote a memo that was proposing a strategy that suggested that uh, Obama's story, his backstory wasn't uniquely American. It wasn't something that we identify necessarily with Americanism because his father was Kenyan and because, you know, he was raised in a single family, these sorts of things, um, a variety of different stuff, and that he'd moved uh, moved around a lot. And so what the, the memo was suggesting was that Hillary Clinton's campaign tried to sort of own the ground of being American and Americanism and sort of playing up that and playing up her backstory and not not questioning Obama's that wasn't anywhere in the memo. It was just right. suggesting that we should be doing everything we can to highlight ourselves and differentiate ourselves in that way. And then the second thing that everybody always points to is a 60 Minutes interview. They'd been questioning Obama's uh, religion and asking if he was a Muslim and these sorts of things. And so they were asking Hillary if she believed or there was any reason to believe and she outright denied it like four times, they just kept asking her the question. And then it, on one answer, she said, you know, as far as I know. And so they used that as far as I know to be like, she was yeah. surreptitiously sort of saying, well, maybe he could be, you know, I'm not saying he's not, I'm not saying. Uh, and I remember that wasn't. too, that they, they, they strapped some booster rockets onto it when she said that. Yeah. And, but if you go and look at the full context of the interview, there's absolutely, you know, nothing there. They're just taking it and trying to take it out of context and blow it up. Into yeah, but for one side, though, I remember because that was during the, the primary and like uh, Rick mentioned before, you know, I was crazy about Obama when he was crazy about Hillary at the time. And I remember thinking like I needed to hear something like a little bit stronger out of her. I remember being like a little hey, bit frustrated. And, and, and by the way, just a quick programming note, that was on our first podcast, so you have to go back and listen to that one. Okay, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Good. Last one. <laughs> uh, well, well, it's that I just remember thinking that she was not definitive enough. She's like, no, 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 we don't have any reason not to believe that. So technically, yeah, she did dismiss it. And I mean, I she did the right thing, too. And maybe is there some I think there's a part of me that says, did she push hard enough back on something like that? No, because she was running against him. But there's no way in this assertion that somehow what she did, like how that would be somehow equated where Donald Trump spent months and months on talk shows and radio and tweets and the absurdity that created this fiasco that was the whole birtherism debate and the whole, you know, and aligning himself with even Orly Tates. There's just, I can't right. imagine how in the world that she thinks or he thinks that he's going to uh, skip away from this thing and say, oh, it was actually her. But I mean, then again, you'll see that story is how it's being played on the right wing media right now. Well, but it's already well, it's it, already working though because everybody is now going back, looking at what she was saying about Obama, analyzing what she was saying, and they stopped 
just talking about what he's been saying, you know, pretty plainly for all these years. So he's done a good job of deflecting that attention. Um, I think one of her weaknesses is that she uh, likes to play it safe. So she's not a person who'll come out and say, um, you know, from, from the moment that she's asked the question, absolutely not. He's, you know, I don't think he's a Muslim. She she's just she's a, she's a, she's got a legal background so she she'll everything. she'll say things like um, you know I at this time I have no inf- no reason to believe he's not and and that ends up hurting her because that's how she leaves herself open to to these attacks where the the basic message is you you didn't come out strong enough to say you know this person was obviously born here um, and and is is not a Muslim um, and and that's that's how I mean that, that's the basic characteristic that. They've, the Trump campaign's been exploiting. Yeah, and then she gets cut on both sides of it as well because when she does speak as an, in an absolute and say something very firmly like we are not putting ground troops into Iraq and Syria, then she gets hit for being being too absolutist as mm-hmm. well. But I want to say something well, about no. what's important about the birtherism issue isn't just you know the it's it's the underlying cause of what makes it makes some people feel it's acceptable to do and it's it's so important because the mentality that allows. Trump and his supporters to think it's okay to, you know, demand the president's papers is the exact same sort of mentality that allows somebody like George Zimmerman to accost Trayvon Martin in the street and demand that he prove that he he's not an interlooper, that he has a right to be there. So it's identifying anybody that feels different than you and suggesting that now because you're not like me, you have to prove that you're worthy of participating. And that's the sort of underlying inherent uh oblivious racism that's really tied to it that people don't understand why it's racist but it is actually a racist it is actually a racist act it is a racist act and you brought up trevon martin that makes my head explode to not go on a rant about that but i won't i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap this particular topic up and this was a great discussion guys thank you but i want to just end it on this is that the most egregious thing that i'm seeing right now with with trump is that he is now in a sense trying to take credit for this okay so now, in essence, what he is saying is, hey, listen, the Clinton campaign started this nightmare with her racist, untrustworthy campaign back in 2008. All I did, I ended yeah, it. Yeah, like he was doing us a favor. Like we need – America yep. needed that birth certificate. Like who really gave a shit? You know, like, does, like nobody gave a shit before he was doing you all made an issue. Favor. Yeah. But I want to point a couple of things out too. Not, not, I mean we all know that's nonsense, but let's also just look at – the timeline and the facts. So this happened roughly in 2011 as far as the release of his long-form birth certificate. And then as early as 2013, okay, Donald Trump was sending out tweets, and I have them pulled up right here. And this is one in December 12, 2013. How amazing. The state health director who verified copies of Obama's, in quotes, birth certificate died in a plane crash today. All others lived. Weird. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's scroll down. And this is in March 2012. This is just months away from from that election. When I was 18, people called me Donald Trump. When he was 18, at Barack Obama was Barry Soweto. Weird. All right, guys. So this guy's full of it. That he didn't. He did not accept that long form birth certificate as anything valid. And guess what? If you were someone who didn't believe that he was born here to begin with. Well, that long form birth certificate wasn't helping was nothing you. more than falsified information. It was a lie. Just like Hillary's doctor writing that she is healthy and had pneumonia is also a lie, which this is the most awesome segue ever. Everybody give Rick a round of applause. Hey, <laughs> okay, topic number two. <laughs> Let's talk about health scare. And Anna, I would love to uh, have you lead this as our as our guest, if you don't mind, ma'am. So I I feel like that – well, just to fill everybody in, I'm sure everybody knows, but there was a 9-11 ceremony on obviously 9-11, and Hillary had to leave early due to um, exhaustion and overheating and, and whatnot. And so um, she went to her daughter's apartment to relax and regroup, and what happened since is the conspiracies of her health have now just shifted into fifth, and they've taken off like a rocket. I mean, let's put this in perspective. Two weeks or so prior to this incident, you had the likes of Sean Hannity and Fox News basically 24-7, starting with Fox and Friends. I'm barely exaggerating when I say 24-7 here, guys. Overly exaggerating, Hillary's coughing, and does she have amnesia? Does she have whatever, you know? And uh, all on and, – and they bring on these hack doctors to do this, like, whack-a-job analysis of her health based on, like, <laughs> seconds of footage of her coughing. 
Well, of course, something like this happens, and the conspiracy theories run wild. So anyway, her doctors have come out since then and said she had essentially walking pneumonia. She was not contagious. And um, that's where it stands right now. Now, the Trump campaign, surprisingly, have actually not ran with this. And my guess is that is certainly not Trump himself, but his advisor saying don't. But to the larger question, we can get into these little subcategories as we move along, but just to the larger question, is the health of Hillary fair game? And I'm going to ask you that. You know, Rick, I've, I've struggled with this one because I actually didn't feel that there was a very gendered aspect to this story. Um, I think that the health of candidates is always an issue. It's just never a big deal. John McCain had to release his medical records because of his age. I think the issue with her and the health scare is, is mainly this portrayal of her as someone who's not forthcoming, not transparent. And uh, before she fainted, basically, I think everybody sort of ignored the, the health scare conspiracy theorists as, as sort of a fringe group. But then once once she fainted during the, uh, during the memorial event, really it was the media that made a big deal of it, not the Trump campaign, which I think is sort of embarrassing for the media. And the Trump cam- campaign was able to take advantage of the situation by making him seem reasonable. So that actually it was very frustrating for me to watch that because I, I would see the headlines. It was like Hillary stumbles. Hillary stumbles twice during the campaign. So if anybody was making it a gender issue, I think it was the media, not, not Trump. And I hate saying anything to give Donald Trump credit in that area, but but that that's that was my take on the the whole thing. You know, and there he did slip, um, pardon that pun, but he did actually fall into his real character a couple of days ago. He was at a rally and he was like, you know, I've been up here for an hour and a half. You, do we think Hillary can handle standing up here for an hour and a half? Anybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> Anybody? And it's just like, I mean, obviously he's alluding to that, and, and so he's not completely innocent, and we all know. I mean, we know that SOB is just dying to rip into yeah, that. If it wasn't for Kelly Conway, there would be 5,000 tweets about it. <laughs> it's, like he's, it's like he has Tourette's, right? And that I don't have the condition, but I, what they say is that you have, to, you have to hold something in, right? And they can kind of resist it for a, a shorter period of time. So they throw him up on stage you know, and tell him before, hold it in, hold it in. And then if enough time elapses, he just can't help himself, just, right? right? He's got to throw something out there. It's just in him. It's a part of him. To answer your question, Rick, that's out there, like, is it – fair game. Sure, you can talk about health. I just don't think it's really that big of a deal. And it just seems like it's a continuation of the same thing that we do every single week, which is what can we talk about where we don't have to, so we can completely avoid anything of substance and policy, right? And so I think that's why everything's fair game. Just don't talk about policy and then they can win because all these things that really should impact people are completely ignored. Like, all right, let's even say that she was sick. So what? I mean, why is that such a big deal if she had some big illness, which she doesn't? But I just think it's it's well. It's time out. Time out. Time out. Time out. When when you say that though, to be fair, well, it is a big deal if she has a big illness. I think we've I mean, had other is... presidents before that have been sick. Yeah, an, enti- I, an entire I, I, world I, I, war was I, I, fought I, by a president with polio. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, so why should I, we rec- I recognize well, that, guys? I think we are legitimizing it. The well, media is legitimizing this by well, by making it such a big conversation. I understand, and I and I get it. We could go back to previous presidents that had all sorts of health issues. I I do think it's fair game to be concerned about the health of a president. We need them to serve four years. We want them to serve four years. And, well, that's uh, like doing a light landing. Of course, nobody's saying that it's not legitimate. What we're saying, what makes this illegitimate is that it's such a big conversation. And the media can kind of like run with it and act like Trump's being the crazy one. But he says it, and then he, they allow that to direct the national conversation for a week. It's, yep. it's silliness. Well, you know, you, know, you know the brilliance of all this from the right wing? Because let's face it, guys. They play dirty, and they play it well. Mm-hmm. And what they have done – and, Zachy, I want you to chime in on this if you don't mind, sir, and correct me if I'm wrong mm-hmm. or share your thoughts with this next comment I'm about to say. But I feel as though the, the right-wing fringe on AM radio and the Sean Hannity's have been sort of planting this seed for months about her coughing, about her, her the way she's walking. I mean, you name it, everything. And then when something actually legit – now, when I say something legitimate happens, let's, it is it – is, noteworthy that she'd had she did have a concussion back in 2012 okay we all we've all had something that has happened to us for, for the nobody's ever broad. interviewed a ceo sorry to interrupt you right. nobody's ever um right. interviewed a ceo for a fortune 500 company and asked him if he's ever had a concussion right we've all had so, concussions yeah we've all had but, concussions. But, but here's but, here, but here's the brilliance of them is that they have been planting these seeds of this like really health scare thing with hillary that she's we think she's very sick 
we think that she's very ill. I don't think that she's physically capable of fulfilling the duties of president. And then what happens is she has to leave a high-profile ceremony weeks away from the first debate in the middle of a presidential election. And then guess what they get to do? They get to kind of scurry off and not say anything. They, they, get, to, they, get, they get to take the high road and not mock it. Because they're the ones that created the media obsessing about it in the first place. Zach, am I wrong? No, I think I think uh, you know it was sort of a convergence of when when it all when it happened when it came out that oh she, she you know she she fainted. I, I my immediate thought was oh this just gave oxygen to all the BS that's been out there in the noise chamber, and you know and Crystal is actually wrote about how suddenly it turned this illegitimate topic into a legitimate topic. Um, yeah, well, his I, article his his article didn't help though. To be honest it, with it, you, I'm glad you brought it, brought that up because he he sort of made it a bigger issue than it needed to be. I, in that well, that same you know, I mean, I'm of two minds on this because I I think that the the Clinton operation, after sort of decades of of taking incoming fire, they they have a propensity towards keeping stuff close to the chest that I think has done them a disservice. I think that, you know, I mean, and, and uh, David Axelrod uh, tweeted about this. You know, th- there's this reflexive need to just to uh, avoid p- putting stuff out there, which I understand. I mean, I wouldn't totally want to be in the position that the Clintons are in. But I think that in, in this situation, maybe this is just at the benefit of hindsight, it, as soon as they got the diagnosis, if they just put it out there, that you know she she's going to cut down for a couple of days because she has pneumonia. That would have taken the legs out from the sort of conspiracy stories. Yeah, why, and why does why why do you think that is, Zachy? Why 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 do they do that? You know, something that's just so I mean, just it's a mundane fact. You know, why would they feel the need to hold that back? Well, uh, you know, my my gut says I think I think she truly thought, well, I'll just cough it out. Yeah. Right. And, and so she when, didn't want to fuel the flame. She said in an interview, "I didn't think it was a big deal." I think she truly didn't think it was a big deal. Right. Um, yeah. But I think I, you know, and again, I'm saying this with hindsight. You know, I, you know, an ounce of prevention where you just get it out there early that she's, she's, she, you know, she's a little bit under the weather, so she'll cut down on a few events, and and then if this had, I mean, the 9/11 thing, she had two bad options. Number one, attend the event while sick. Number mm-hmm. two, don't attend. Yeah. Right. So what's worse? Spit in the face of the uh, of the nine eleven victim. Sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's it's. I'm sure she figured. You know what? I'm just gonna tough it out through this thing for a couple hours. I I doubt she thought she would actually end up sort of passing out. You know. Well, I sort of had a a different take on it when it happened, or maybe since it's happened. But I, I think that definitely when she got sick, it sort of gave some legitimacy and validated the whole conspiracy theory leading up to that. Although they weren't talking about pneumonia. They were talking about her having some debilitating illness. They weren't talking about some potential future where she right. might catch a, you know, a communicable in bacterial infection. Um, but I think what happened was it definitely gave some fuel to that fire, but then the fire flamed up and then it just, it burned out because the yeah. Trump campaign doesn't have a good option after that either, because up to that, they can, they can sort of needle at it and say, Oh, well, she's doing this and she's doing that. And we don't know and what's happening. But then after she gets pneumonia, then their choice is to either let it drop or now pick on somebody who's actually sick and has a legitimate something that's definable. Um, right. And that doesn't Very make true. them look good either. So it flamed it up, but then it went away. I haven't heard anybody talk about the health stuff all week. So And, and Trump putting that out there too, that's, that was really ridiculous. And <laughs> I mean that sounds really contrived where he has to do like the right thing, which is – Say that uh, you know he he hopes that she gets better soon you know and that was like the first time I've ever seen him even act semi-human. I um, shouldn't at all. Yeah, it, it took like I mean, but even him, I was like, wow, that now makes you seem really ingenuine because you sounded like a decent person. Yeah, did you like when he was like, we just want her to get back out there and get back on the campaign trail, don't we? And like ninety percent of his audience was like, boo, yeah, no. no, she should no, die, boo, boo, <laughs> die, you know, Trump. It, it loosely yeah. related to that. I I heard something interesting. Uh, Last night on Rachel Maddow, that these are the first candidates to ever run for president for when they win a certain primary state that they don't exchange phone calls, right? Because the level of civility is gone. Right. Well, mm-hmm. when they both won the nomination, they didn't call each other. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, isn't that, and, that, and that's, if, that's, it, that's 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 strange. It's, I mean, it's it's different, but but it's because it's not he's not a normal candidate, right? I mean, those phone calls happen when like when she was running against Obama, right? Those phone calls happen in her senatorial campaigns. It did not happen because he does not comport himself like a regular candidate, like a normal, decent human being, frankly. Yeah, and if, if she wins, which I hope she does, and I think she will, 
But if she wins, is, is he going to give a concession speech? Oh, I, is he, I'm it, uh, well, well, horribly scared about what that confession, concession speech is going to He's going to say like. her victory was a conspiracy. Of it's course, he's got to go. The system is rigged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, that's going to be, you talk about unprecedented, that's going to be a whole... On, on the stage oh. on that night, they're going to make him do that, but I bet you the next morning he is out there starting the role, because he's not going to be ready to leave the stage. He will be on talk shows the next morning. You know, it's kind of like he, he says something on stage, and then once he gets away from the script and he and he gets himself kind of rolling on some sort of right-wing media, it goes, it's going to come off the rails. And yeah. Isn't he going to plug his new TV network that he's going to start with? And, uh, and uh, wait, time out, everybody. Let's hit the pause button there for a second, Anna. I think I, I are, are do you when you say that just now? Are you, you are you being serious? Or are you trying to be comedic? Because I for one no, actually I'm believe both. That's good. I think it's funny, yep. but I'm, I'm, I I do actually think that's that's his big picture goal. Oh yeah, there's I a agree. lot of conversation about that. Yeah, this is all a huge publicity stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's what the point of this thing was. It just caught on fire, and now he's like, oh well, I guess I've come this far. I might as well keep running for president. Yeah, I'm still not sure he really wants to be president. So I'm sort of imagining or maybe hoping for some major disqualifying event that actually happens between now and November where it just doesn't force him to drop out of the race, but that he can sort of use as an out or that it makes it look like he, you know, just makes him a completely unviable candidate for the office. And then he just flat out loses. I'm, I'm yeah, totally Jerry, imagining you, you that. You feel that way for a certain reason by how he acts is because we keep thinking that he's a, he's a, you know, he's a smart guy. Every single movie he makes is really calculated. It's because we're used to those type of people being in there. He is a loose cannon, and it, we just can't wrap our heads around that he probably does want to win this thing, but he has such, I don't know if you call them, you know, I don't, it's clinical, you know, uh, well, I'm trying to think of like the word there. He, is, he has a lack of mental fortitude to be able to hold it all together. He does want to win. He's just that bad at this. Okay, so we just, we just have Anna's and Jeremy's and, and Michael's opinion on this. Zachy, let's you and I chime in on this. I think this is a very interesting subtopic that we just inadvertently stumbled upon. The question here is, does Trump really want to be president? Here's my answer. Yes. I used to think that he didn't. I do believe that he does. I believe that his ego is so big, why would he not want the biggest egotistical job on the planet and the power that comes along with that? However, I do think that his, his contingency plan, if he doesn't, is, cool, I'm going to start a network, and I'm going to be Hillary's worst nightmare in her first term. That is sort of where my head's at on this. Zachy, what do you think? Well, I think, yes, he wants to be president, but he's he wants it without having the sophistication to understand what the job entails. Uh, he, he lacks the, the lifetime of, of working in government to understand, you know, that it's, it's not just taking the bows. And I think, you know, when we learned about how they went about finding a vice president, which was basically calling people and saying, hey, do you want to do everything that the president does and let the other guy take the bows? Um, you know, that, that tells you something about where his head is at as far as what, what he expects to do while in the job. Right, sort of the way he runs his foundation and his charities. It's all other people's money and other people's work. He's just putting his name on it. Which, by yeah. the way, that should terrify anybody from voting for him, but nobody ever talks about that because that's not the stuff the media ever asks about. Well, I think that's yeah. one of the things that I'm talking about as like a potential disqualifying event is that the, the stuff about the Clinton Foundation has legs in the media, but there's no real meat to it. There's no evidence or proof or, of wrongdoing there. But the stuff within the, the Trump Foundation – there's legitimate wrongdoing there. There's things that are not appropriate, and I think ultimately some more stuff like that is going to come out, and I think it's going to really – it's really going to drive his campaign in the, in the wrong direction. And uh, let me ask you a question, almost as an attorney, if you don't mind. Uh, we're, as we're talking about things being released, you know, you know, birth certificates and, 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 and medical reports and everything, there's also this other thing that's looming, which of course is Donald Trump's tax returns. And uh, he does not have to release these. As an attorney, as just a person, as a commentator, do you think that it should be it should be a, a legal requirement for a presidential nominee to release their tax returns? Uh, no, I don't think it should be a legal requirement. I'm actually not sure that that's possible because you know somebody like Donald Trump that might implicate his Fifth Amendment rights if he's made any misrepresentations on his tax returns. It's not um, a constitutional requirement either. Right, and, and it's also. 
I think the fact that it's voluntary helps the public see, you know, how forthcoming somebody is willing to be. So if it were a legal requirement and everybody did it, then nobody would run for president who, you know, didn't have um, who who had any concerns about what was in their tax returns. Mm. Um, but I do think that his uh, unwillingness to do it is something that the media certainly hasn't focused on enough. I mean, everyone's they, they did do a good job of trumpeting the fact that Hillary didn't talk about or hasn't released her medical records. But the fact that he hasn't released his tax returns and he goes around uh, representing himself as an attractive candidate because he knows how to uh, do business really well. I mean, that's something that they should be focusing on. And, and they just they let him get away with so much because he has he's he's basically biffed from Back to the Future. People, our society <laughs> cows down to these big personalities um, who who bully people and the media has totally gone along with it. It's been very frustrating to, to watch this election cycle and seeing how the media just lets him get away with murder. You know, the I don't want to run with this too much, but I love the Back to the Future movies and I'm a pop culture geek, so I'm going to... Wrong I'm podcast. Gonna take a, Wrong podcast. I'm, I, no, no, no. I'm going to take a moment with this. Isn't it a little frightening when you think about Back to the Future 2 and Marty comes back to 85 after Biff went back and ruined everything and he's in charge in his casino... Isn't it just almost – it's poignant thinking like what a reflection that is of a Trump <laughs> presidency. Trump presidency, right. It, it is. It is <laughs> Yeah, like, like Trump went back in time and set this up because there's no way an idiot like that could possibly make well, it just, anywhere in life. <laughs> it's just – I don't want to – again, I don't want to run with it too much because especially Zach, you know, we'll talk to <laughs> Well, back, back to but the – It is. Back to the, it, 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 it is frightening. But you know, I don't want to get into the weeds of the legal stuff, but you don't think that – Making it a requirement if you're a presidential nominee that that doesn't supersede the fact that he could give up his Fifth Amendment because my my issue here is this is that you guys talk about well it'll it'll let the public know how forthcoming that individual is but people don't care that Trump's not doing it and that's the scary part is that no one they don't care he's not losing one vote over this and you know, it's because the Clinton the Clinton campaign is focusing on the wrong thing I think the way that they message it they say. You know, and he's not even releasing his tax returns. Like, that's bad, but I think in my problem across the board, the way that liberals do it is ask, ask why. Why do you need to see those tax returns? Repeat that over and over again. Like, where are your investments? What happens if you're president and you've got investments overseas with the Russians, you know? Build up why this is important. Otherwise, most people don't have time to think about, oh, yeah, I guess we're not going to see his tax returns. What do they care? Talk well, about you, the substance. You do have well, to, you do have Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren on the Senate floor yesterday did, and it was awesome. Well, you do have to right. file a financial disclosure that is supposed to cover a lot of that stuff. I, I don't necessarily think that re having to release the tax returns should be a legal requirement either. And I, my problem is that the media isn't holding him accountable as to why. I mean, they just take at face value that he's under audit when he's not provided any proof or evidence that he's under audit. And he certainly could. He, there's a letter that comes from the IRS that says you're going to be audited. If he has that letter, he could release that. And he's not releasing any actual information about his tax returns. But nobody is really is really asking for that. We're just saying, oh, well, he's under audit. And then his excuse is that anybody who's actually seen my tax returns says, no, 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 you can't let anybody else see these. I mean, to me, that's the that's the most frightening thing about it is that he's literally saying people who have seen this say I shouldn't show them to you. Well, and what my, my hope is is that Hillary will pounce on this during the debates. And since today is Master Rick Segway Day, what better way to talk about the next topic? Well, that was an interesting survey. Which is the debates. Yeah, it's two in a row, man. <laughs> so just on a quick side programming note, uh, the day after – the two days after the first debate, we're actually going to have GOP consultant Mac Makoviak on the show. We're very excited about that. Uh, Matt's been seen on a variety of shows as Meet the Press – along with Chris Hayes, Rachel Maddow, etc. And he, he and I, will, uh, along with the panel, will be kind of breaking down that first debate. So that'll be a lot of fun. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so about the debates. We are now well, – let's talk about the polls for just a moment. And then we'll, it's all kind of tied in together. Because I think that the debate that's coming up, which is what, in eight days, seven days? We're close. Is going to be the thing that, that changes the trajectory of these polls as we see them now. So as most of us know, it's now after Labor Day. The conventions are long behind us. This is when things really start getting real. And what's funny about this election is that certain things have been kind of against the rules, right, that it's so unpredictable that you can't apply things that have happened, like pass is not prologue, and a lot of things that have unfolded in this debate. But in terms of just the way polls typically shift, it's been pretty pretty consistent in terms of how we've seen polls in the last 15, 20 years in presidential elections. So here we are. It's tightening. 
and the most recent polls just just this morning because I like to focus on the swing states, right, guys? We don't elect presidents based on popular vote. And if you don't really embrace the significance of that, all I can say is go look at the year 2000. <laughs> okay, that just doesn't happen. It's all about the electoral map. And what's, uh, things, what's that? It's a swing state anymore. Well, okay, that's a, that's a conversation for another day. But uh, right now in Ohio, Trump is actually quite ahead of, of, of Clinton by five points. Um, you have him up a little bit in Florida, and he's closing in, and he's pretty much eight to nine points ahead in Iowa. Now, the good news is she still has a very strong path to victory, okay? It's a lot more difficult for him to get to 270, but this is a little concerning. There, there are, it is certainly becoming easier. And, Zachy, you posted an article the other day. Was that from the New York Times or New York Post about – it's it you know a Trump presidency is now real. We need to we need to take it seriously. Yeah, it's from New York Magazine. New York Magazine. Yeah, it was a good article. Yeah, and they're right. This is this is a real election, and I said this on the show a couple of weeks ago. I said that don't under, don't underestimate pissed off America. I think there's a lot to be said for that because I, I can break down the disparity in terms of the minority vote. Basically, anything to put it in simple terms, he basically has the 45 and up white pissed off America vote, right? And she has just about everything else. The problem is there's an enthusiasm issue. We have too many millennials that were Bernie supporters supporting Gary Johnson right now. And even though it was announced this morning that he's not going to be on the stage with them in the first debate, it's still problematic in terms that he'll be on the ballot, which is another issue because if you were a Bernie supporter and you supported this quasi-socialist big government guy, and now you're supporting an anti-government isolationist, with all due respect, I'm not sure you were ever supporting Bernie based on policy. Right, that's just you were against Hillary Clinton. Right, you're just against Hillary Clinton. You're fighting the man, man. Yeah, but but it but it but it's a problem. So what's going to change the trajectory on this? In my view, is this first debate. And again, we're just a few days away from it. So Anna, what do you think? What are your expectations for this first debate? If you if you had a crystal ball in front of you, I hate to ask a broad question, but what do you think is going to happen? Who has more to lose? How about that? Who has more to lose in this first debate? Is it Hillary or is it Trump? Oh, I I think definitely Hillary. Since you asked me for my prediction, I think that she will do better than people expect because she everybody thinks of her as you know sort of a female Al Gore boring, buttoned up, very establishment. And I think that she will bring more passion and authenticity than, than everybody expects. But I also think that nobody will care, unfortunately, because um, the people who are, are against her probably won't even watch a debate like this. They don't actually make their opinions based off of information or, or things that they're watching. So um, so my prediction is, is twofold. One, that she will do better, but two, that it will not matter. Um, but going back to your general question, um, she, I, I do think she has more to lose because um, she was, that, that's sort of the nature of when you're ahead in the polls, even though you're not ahead by much. I think that you have to maintain enthusiasm in your own base. And if she stumbles and she loses even her own supporters, I think, I think we have a big problem. We do have a big problem. And in terms of enthusiasm, what I've seen the last couple of days is, I don't know, did you guys all see Michelle Obama yesterday on the stump? Yeah, she's great, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, wow. We need more of that, and we need, we, need, we need Barack out there more. We need Elizabeth Warren out there more. I don't really know if Bernie Sanders does this any good. He, he, he goes out and gives a 45-minute speech and doesn't even mention Hillary's name until 30 minutes into it. So, you know, whatever. Just he, he, can, he can step aside for all I care unless he really wants to roll up his sleeves and get up to bat. But um, back to this first debate. So here's sort of my view, and then just open it up to the panel, okay? If this can be a policy-focused debate, which I'm very, very glad that it's just the two of them. Now, I, at a principle, I think Gary Johnson deserves to be up on that stage. But I don't make the rules. He didn't hit 15%. He's not there. So since he's not there, let me just say as a, as a supporter of Hillary and someone that really wants her to get elected, I'm glad he's not there. That's a personal thing versus like a principal thing. So now it's just the two of them. If this debate can stay policy focused, he's toast. He's absolute toast. If she doesn't try to overplay her hand and try to ask some overwrought question to try to trap him to make him look stupid – she could fall into those pitfalls as well. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. So how does how does she do that, Zachy? And and I and I and I know that some of this is going to be Lester Holt as well and how he moderates, but what what do you think? Like if you if you were advising her on this, 
<laughs> I hate to put this in here loud. This is a tough. This is a tough scenario to get my head wrapped around. But if you're advising her on this this, this debate, what what would you say to her? Well, I, I mean, I would say not to overthink it. I mean, she she has a skill set that's already well defined. She knows the ins and outs of policy, and I think she should play to those strengths. I mean, I actually think. I'm not crazy about seeing the poll sort of tightening up, but I'm actually the, I'm heartened by that a little bit because I think she does better when she, you know, when there's the sense that she has more to prove. Um, certainly, that was the case in the 2008 uh, the primaries uh, with with President Obama, now President Obama. Uh, I I think that as you said, I, she she shouldn't overplay her hand, and so I think uh, the best strategy with Donald Trump is rope and dope. And let him talk himself in in circles, and let the let his moronic, you know, the the nonsense that he says, let those be the sound bites, and that'll be what contrasts with Hillary Clinton sounding, uh, uh, you know, authoritative and like she knows what she's talking about because she does know what she's talking about. I, I want a Reagan Jimmy Carter moment, and I I, I hate to like reference this because it uh, Jimmy Carter deserved a second term in my view, but you know it is what it is, right? That that's 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 behind us. But man, you have to give Reagan credit. He he won that first debate with that one line. You guys remember what it was? By the way, I say first debate. Back then, they only did have one debate. But are uh, you so better off now it. than you were four years ago? That was strong, but it was when he said, "And there you go again." <laughs> and there and, and there you go again, Mr. President. And to me, that was like it just it just sort of made him look so small. Yeah, President Carter. And we need a she needs a moment like that. And, there, and I wish that – you know who I wish was advising here on this debate in a weird way? And I know I'm, you guys might fall out of your chairs. Everybody sitting down? <laughs> okay. I, I, would, I would actually be peace of mind if I knew that George W. Bush was in the room with her for just a couple hours. Could you imagine – I mean I'm not a fan of Bush, right? But I will say this about him. I could see him in a debate with Trump and just kind of give him this look – and like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> she, well, she's she's not good. You know what I mean? Like, of... you guys, you know what I'm saying? Like, he could do that so brilliantly, and uh, she needs something like that. She needs that Reagan Bush moment. Wow, I just I just applauded two Republican presidents. Bipartisan for the win. <laughs> Well, she's not good at delivering those zingers is the problem. I mean, when she tries to when she's tried to say those before and they come off as unnatural. I think that she just needs to be on that stage and just do what she does. Be very smart. Talk about policy. Not get too fired up, and do not get sucked into uh, anything from him. Anything that's kind of like that's off kilter. But you know, I don't know what they're preparing for in the in the Clinton campaign because he is going to be able to for some period of time. You know, he's got some ideas what those questions are going to be. He's going to practice them. I think he's going to be able to maybe be able to hold his own. But I guess maybe the goal of hers should be is just to keep him talking because once he runs out of talking points. That's when he's going to have the problem, and then she can pounce. But she's got to be very careful about how she approaches it with him because, remember, it's all about perception. It's not necessarily it's about all, the it's all, it, it's all about perception. And let's, hey, let's, let's talk about that for, for a minute, Mr. Malloy. Let's talk about getting in the mud with Trump, right? There is a balancing act to this. He's going to try to pull her in, and it's not wise for her to go in because he'll win that, he'll win that rodeo, right? That's – that's what he does. He's he is a, he's a he's a wrestler. He's a bully. He's a mudslinger. That's all he is. Yeah, that's but at the same time, she can't look weak. And so, here's sort of a vision I have in my head. He's going after her about her husband's infidelities, right? And then she, if she just could look over at him and say, you know what? We had a lot of marital problems. I love my husband. We kept our marriage together. Unlike you, that likes to bounce around with the wives. Now, can we move on? You know, and, and I hate to say that because it's so catty, but I'm I'm saying that I th I want her to have stuff stuff like that yeah, prepared. Yeah, what the hell does that have to do with leading the country? Yeah, say, you know, have right. some things like that. You know, right? But but, but make sure to you got to get a you've got to get a hit in there though. You have because it has to something has to offset that and to move on. And you know, I hate it. It makes me sick to even like reference that because I don't care that he has three wives. That's his deal. That has nothing to do with him being president, nor does Bill's infidelities. Huh. But at the same time, though. Is it even it, Jeremy? Help, Jeremy, help me out here. You see what I'm saying? There has to be. She has to be kind of. She has to have this really tricky balancing act, does she not? Yeah, I think she'll have some of those things prepared. I think she'll obviously be far more prepared on policy and be able to answer those questions way better than Trump will. And I think that that will be influential for a lot of the people in the middle, some of the independents who are undecided. I think that's what they're waiting to make their decision based off of is is policy. I also think Trump will do. Uh, he'll hold his own just fine. He's not going to make a complete ass of himself. I mean, there's always the possibility that he could. I think a lot of his followers are going to be tuning into debates 
looking to see the same Trump with all of the zingers and the playing to the crowd that they got to see in the primaries, and they're not going to see that, and they're going to be a little bit disappointed by that. I don't think it's going to change their minds about whether or not they're voting for Trump, but I think he will do, I think he'll be just fine holding his own. And I think Hillary's going to do a great job, especially when it comes to policy. I think she'll be, uh, she'll be ready with some of those singers, but I think that Trump is probably going to be following the Palin model of debating where it's whatever the question is. She just flat out says, you know, I don't have to answer your questions. I'm going to answer the way that I want to answer and just switches it to something else. And then he'll have his talking points, uh, his talking points prepared. I also, I also want to go back to something that you said earlier about Gary Johnson and how you were glad he wasn't going to be on the stage. But I actually think it would be better for Hillary if he were there for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one is that it creates a, a lot of the people who are following Gary Johnson, as you said earlier, have no idea really what his policies are. And if you can set him on stage next to Hillary and they hear his answers to some of those questions and then they go, oh, wait, he believes that? That's, that's, totally, that's totally asinine. That's totally insane. That's, that's not point. what I believe. And then Hillary can give her more progressive answer to that, you know, talking about her college plan and the child care and all of that sort of stuff. And it, it differentiates her in a way that makes progressives realize that going libertarian is is not really a good thing. But ultimately, I, I, I agree. But let me just say this real fast. The, the problem that I have, and I think is that that's fine, and there's a lot to be said for that. But I don't want her on stage with two guys or two just two people pouncing on her on email. We don't we don't need that reinforcement. I think that is worse than that could be better. That's just my opinion. Anna, what do you think? You know, what you, every time I hear the word email in the context of this election, I get so angry because I do criminal defense, and the facts are so far from an <laughs> indictable offense. It's laughable. Huh. Um, it, it's unbelievable. And, you know, people, a lot of times you argue with somebody about it and they'll say, you know, like, well, you know, are you an expert? And it's like, okay, I, I don't know if I'm an expert. I know what the law says, but you know who might be an expert? The head of the FBI, right. uh, the attorney general of the United States, both of whom have said this was not something that it wasn't even like close to being chargeable. Um, so, but I, I, sorry, I went off on a little bit of a tirade there. Um, no, I love, I, I, love I do it. agree that, um, you know, it would be bad for her to have two people attacking her generally. I, I don't know that Gary Johnson would, would uh, rely on the emails. I don't know that that necessarily plays to his particular base. That's something that's more of a Trump base, uh, that's attractive to the Trump base, because they like to say things like she's a corrupt, you know, she should be a convicted felon. She's, she should be corrupt. And I, I'm not sure that's the same uh, rhetoric that appeals to the Johnson followers. But, um, but just generally, I will say that I do not like the idea of two men and one woman on a stage because you know it'll, they'll be interrupting her all the time. It'll be hard for her to get yeah. uh, get get uh, get a word in edgewise. So just from from that standpoint, uh, I'm glad it's just the two of them. I just haven't seen Gary Johnson make a public appearance anywhere where he did anything to help himself. Ultimately, every time he's on TV <laughs> or he's making a speech, he stumbles and does something that ultimately creates a more negative impression. Yeah. And we need possible. Trump talking as much as possible too. I mean, exactly like, look at the foreign policy. Uh, what was that? The that uh, the foreign policy forum that MSNBC did, commander you know, in chief. commander in chief, it gave him just, you know, he had very little time, and they start going off talking about, you know, taking the oil, committing war crimes, right, and uh, you know, maybe firing all of the generals, and that was something that he was supposedly prepared for. So, in, in, in the end, Malloy, you're glad that Gary Johnson's not on stage too, correct? Yes, I'm glad he's not okay. on stage. I want the focus on I Trump. Too. I want I want more stuff to come out of his mouth. Yeah, I I, th I think that you know a two person debate is something that we really haven't seen Donald Trump in. I mean, um, when who was that guy on the? St I forgot his name even. The the third candidate with, between Bernie and Hillary, and then there was that one tan guy. I forgot his name already. Tan guy. <laughs> the governor, the governor of Baltimore. What was his name? Oh no, my gosh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. I can't I can't I can't get John Boehner out of my head. Well, I, I know because I said he was tan, <laughs> but that's how irrelevant uh, I thought he was. And when he was on the debate stage with Bernie and Hillary, I was just annoyed because I was like, nobody cares what this guy has to say. You know, maybe I'm in the minority there. Well, and let's not forget, guys, it's also be careful what we wish for for those of us that would want him on stage, because I remember 1992 quite well. OK, Martin O'Malley, was, by the way. Uh, yeah. Martin O'Malley. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he was a hell of a guy. Just just not not very exciting. Boring as hell.
He was a little. Or, he was a little too intense for me. Like he was just. He seemed to like really angry at times. I liked. I liked definitely his substance, but his delivery was a little off. But uh, George Bush lost the presidency because uh, because Ross Perot. He did. Yeah, that's you, true. I mean, there's that's not there's true. not a lot of people that, that would argue with me about yeah, that. I true. mean, Bill Clinton became president because Bush was a first was a one term president because this little billionaire from Texas stepped in. And speaking of billionaires from Texas, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here before we do our little closing statements. Anybody see uh, Mark Cuban? His little proposal to Trump yesterday. Yeah, I follow his tweets. His, his, he's great. He hammers people. His syntax is horrible, but he's good. Oh, listen, <laughs> the writer in the room. He he, so, he hits Trump like the hardest on the thing. All that he day, hates the every most day. About money. You know, and because Trump is like even shooting way back to what we're talking about his tax returns. He's not releasing those tax returns because he's not worth ten billion dollars. He might not be worth one billion dollars. He cannot show it. It destroy his brand. Anna, Zachy, did you guys see what I'm talking about? That he offered Trump ten million dollars to do a one on one interview with Mark Cuban. <laughs> I didn't see that. I, I didn't see that. Okay. But that's yeah. It's awesome. And he had, and his thing was you can't talk about the Clintons, right? And you have to answer questions about policy based on fact. Right. Just you and me and a camera yeah. crew. Just you and I and a camera crew, and that's it. And what, as a as a guy that's a Dallas native and that still lives in this great city, and I get embarrassed by how my state is represented on the national level. Because if you live in Dallas or Austin or even a little, you know, even Houston, you're kind of you're in a bubble. You sometimes forget that you live in Texas. Right? You have, you're easily reminded once you get you know Greg Abbott and Rick Perry and. And others talking on, and then the way we're always represented on the national stage, it drives me crazy. So it's really cool, also for you know a, a Dallas guy, even though he's not originally from here, he's still he's still the head coach of our our team, our NBA team. And so that's that's good stuff. All right, guys, I'm going to go into our famous predictions here that I completely ripped off from the McLaughlin group, but I don't care. I love it. Does anybody just have any closing things they want to say before we get into that? Yeah. Anybody? All right, good talk, guys. I appreciate it. So without further ado. Our predictions, Zachy. I think that uh, Trump will benefit from lowered expectations in the first debate. Uh, I think people are sort of expecting him to just piss all over himself, and I think if if he doesn't do that, they'll say that he came across as very presidential. Yeah, the bar is low for him. Very low. It's very low. Anna, predictions. You know, this may be more of a hope than a prediction, but I think that Hillary will actually surprise us and have a stellar debate performance, and I think she will be able to respond to um, Trump's attacks, especially more of his personal attacks really well. I think her campaign has been thinking about these debates ever since he became the nominee, and hopefully she will be more prepared to, uh, to respond to him and balance being able to look strong without sounding shrill. Let's, let's hope so, for sure. Predictions, Jeremy? Yeah, I think that over the course of the next few weeks, the next 50 days or so, the polls will continue to look close for most of the time, as they always do coming into the uh, nearing up to Election Day. But I think ultimately on Election Day, Hillary will probably win the popular vote by four or five points. I don't think she'll get to 50 percent because I think Governor Johnson will probably end up with six or seven percent. But I think she'll be in the 47, 48 percent range and Trump will be down somewhere around 43. Again, let's hope so. Predictions, Michael Malloy. I think that Hillary Clinton um, needs uh, for Donald Trump's performance to be like the true Donald Trump that we all know he is. So she's going to dispatch her surrogates over the next couple of weeks um, to start goading him um, from afar, talking about his money, antagonizing him, and most of all saying that he's not going to be the real Trump. They're going to control him on stage to make sure he gets the message and thinks to himself, I can't listen to my uh, advisors. I have to do the real me because they don't control me. And they're going to use that as a way to (laughs) make him do it from afar. From afar. Within the next two weeks, Spanish-speaking ads will pound the airwaves in king swing states, which will galvanize the Latino voters and solidify Hillary's victories in those states. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Left Shoe Politics Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Left Shoe Politic, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Left Shoe Politics. Search for our channel on YouTube, and you can find us on the LSP website, LeftShoePolitics.com.